Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to speak about this evening on this anonymous program that has been designed uh, to focus our attention on this most wonderful book, the Bible? My, my, if only, if only we would, all of us would spend more time in the Word of God. Can you think of anything that is more profitable than to sit at the feet of Almighty God and hear Him speak to you or to me? That's what happens when we listen to the Bible. You know, if some great person of the world, the President of the United States or a king or uh, some notable person would personally invite one of us to come uh, to this uh, individual's office because he wanted to speak with us for a few minutes, we would uh, be thrilled, uh, we would be overjoyed, we would be honored, we would think, wow, how could this happen to me? Who am I? And yet here God, who is infinitely greater than any president of any country or any notable person in the world, it, it has given us a means by which we can sit at his feet and listen to him speak to us because that is effectively what is happening whenever we open the Bible and begin to carefully read it. It is God speaking to us. And isn't it wonderful that we have this privilege? It's something we don't deserve at all. The question is, is there any thrill? Is there any thanks to God that we have this wonderful privilege of hearing speak us, Him speak to us? Unfortunately, we think our time is more precious than to take time for God to speak to us. We have too many things to do tonight or today. We just don't have time. Thank you, Lord. Maybe another time. Oh, what a pity. What a pity. Well, now we have listeners from many parts of the world, and here's a listener in uh, uh, Brazil and asking a very, very practical question on, that is very important on today's scene. The question is, would you, uh, I would like to know uh, uh, how we are to understand where it is written and confirmed by Christ that the gifts of 1 Corinthians 12 will not happen anymore in a body, uh, specifically that there will be no more miracles than healing. Now, the Bible is written with very earthly language. Uh, that is uh, language that uses the words that we use in common conversation and so on. But we have to find uh, the spiritual or the gospel meaning. And 1 Corinthians 12 is, is, uh, is abused about as badly as any part of the Bible by those who look, read these verses and violate the principle that we are to compare spiritual things with spiritual and we are to find the gospel in what we are reading. We read in 1 Corinthians 12 uh, where God uh, indicated that there are various gifts that he gave to those who were uh, part of the local congregations. And uh, uh, he says, for example, in verse 9, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another uh, discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And there are a great many people today, a great many, this is a teaching that has spread like wildfire all through the world, throughout the church world, who want to take these verses very literally, just as they stand, and they're saying, you see, God here is definitely teaching. 
that if we're part of the body of Christ, that is the local congregation, we can have an expectation that God may give us the gift of healing or the gift of being able to do miracles or the gift of prophecy and they understand prophecy as being able to somehow foretell the future or get some kind of a special message from God through a dream or a vision and doesn't the Bible clearly indicate this well the fact is that we have to understand these verses very very carefully uh, because otherwise we're going to uh, have a, a set up a, a gospel that the Bible does not offer at all first of all it says to one is given the gift of faith now the, when we study the Bible the gift of faith has to do with salvation faith is really a synonym for Christ himself he, he is faithful faith is a work and and Christ had to do all the work to save us uh, throughout the church age everybody in the congregation did not have the gift of faith only those who became true believers and in many churches uh, the number of true believers was very tiny compared with those who were not believers and unless we were a true believer we had not been given the gift of faith that is the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ then it talks about the gift of healing uh, and when we search out the Bible is God teaching that it was his plan that physical healing is to be the result of the gospel and there are a great many who look at it just that way that if we're a true believer we can lay our hands on somebody and that person will become well and this is proven by the fact that all again and again there are these uh, evangelists and these preachers who uh, conduct crusades and what have you and uh, and uh, uh, there we see people who are blind become uh, able to see we see people who are lame and they begin to walk they throw away the crutches and so on the fact is however however uh, if you go to a large healing crusade of some kind you will also see the hospital beds uh, that have people in them uh, that are obviously crippled or very ill and they always go out of that crusade exactly the way they came in uh, in other words there is no miraculous healing going on there's a lot of deception a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, chicanery uh, that is uh, where the idea is the end that justifies the means sure this evangelist has deceived all the people watching by faking a, a healing uh, uh, in one way or another a miraculous healing but didn't it cause a lot of people to trust in the Lord Jesus doesn't that justify uh, the, uh, the fact that this was a deception and uh, and so they live with that kind of an attitude and that is all wrong it's contrary to the word of god fact is if physical healing were the goal of the gospel it would as i've indicated many times it would be a disaster it would be terrible because eventually everybody dies unless christ comes first of course that will be true in our day in all likelihood but throughout the history of the church everybody finally died and normally we die of an illness of some kind and uh, therefore if the purpose of the of the gift of healing was to miraculously see people physically healed it was a terrible terrible disaster it would but the wonderful thing is the gift of healing as we compare spiritual things with spiritual has to do with the healing of our sin sick souls we are every human being 
is infected by the disease of sin and the effect of that infection is that eventually we will end up under the wrath of God, the second death, the most terrible death imaginable. But when we become saved, that is when we are spiritually healed of our sin, it means we become a child of God and then we have eternal life. And wherever there are true believers at any time in history as they share the gospel with others, uh, God could apply, that, that is throughout the church age, God could apply that gospel to the hearts of those that were being witnessed to by this true believer and that person too could become saved. They, they had the gift of healing. Now, again, the working of miracles. In the Bible, there are three Greek words that are frequently translated miracles. There is the word uh, simeon, uh, which is also translated signs, and, uh, and there is the Greek word tiras, which is the uh, translated wonders very frequently. Jesus went about doing signs and wonders. Satan even can do signs and wonders. They were true uh, miraculous acts of some kind. But on the other hand, there's another word that is occasionally used and translated as miracle. It's the word dunamis. And that is the word that is used in 1 Corinthians 12. Not Simeon or Tyrus, but dunamis. And that is a word that uh, identifies also definitely with the, with the miracle of salvation. We read, for example, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the apostles were told, Ye shall receive power, that is, dunamis, and ye shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. We read about the dunamis, the power of the resurrection. And every true believer throughout the church age had the gift of dunamis, that is, of whenever they would share the gospel of the uh, when God uh, would apply that word of God to the lives of those who were being witnessed to, they could uh, become saved if that was God's plan. And so that is what is in view here. Not physical miracles of some, uh, not f uh, physical miracles of some kind. That is not the nature of the gospel at all. Prophecy to another, the gift of prophecy, and prophecy. Uh, the Bible says in Acts 2 that every, uh, throughout the New Testament era, every true believer would be a prophet. And what is a prophet? Someone who declares the word of God. And so uh, uh, that, uh, that is characteristic of every true believer. Uh, we are commanded to go out into the world with the gospel. And so, you, and now when it talks about the gift of tongues, that was a very special gift that uh, was, we found, only recorded in connection with the church at Corinth. We read about this in 1 Corinthians 14, and particularly, although it's alluded to in 1 Corinthians 13 also. And, and that only, uh, that was true, that there were some individuals in the church at Corinth that uh, uh, would receive a message in an unknown tongue and in a, some kind of a heavenly language. And there were others who had the gift of interpretation of tongues, even as it's mentioned here in 1 Corinthians 12. So, and uh, they were, uh, these were true believers, and, and uh, th this was additional message from God to the congregation. Frequently it was in the form of, of prayer, uh, of a prayer. But, a few decades later, when the Bible was finished, this in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14 was written probably around 60 or 65 A.D., and, and the Bible was finished about approximately A.D. 95. And when the Bible was finished, God said they were not to add any more to the Word of God. So the gift of prophet, no, the gift of tongues or interpretation of tongues 
Uh, well, the gift of interpretation of tongues would continue, but, but the gift of tongues could not continue because there is no more, more uh, uh, possibility of God speaking uh, any longer. And so uh, if anybody claims that they have received a message from God in a, in a tongue, uh, they they spoke in in some kind of a, a odd language, a heavenly language. They thought we would, could know it was not of Christ; it was of Satan. And so the gift of interpretation continues to today, as even as the gift of prophecy and the gift of of dunamis of healing uh, and the gift of healing, they all continue today spiritually, spiritually only in connection with the gospel, not in at all, uh, literally, as a lot of people uh, uh, want to try to believe, as I indicated. Uh, but uh, so interpretation of tongues continues spiritually. The moment someone claims that they have a, a message from God uh, in, uh, through a, a mysterious act of tongues or through a vision or whatever, we immediately can discern whether that person is coming from Satan or whether he's coming from Christ. And if he's if he is saying that is he's got a message directly from God, we know that it came, that this person is speaking on behalf of Satan, because Christ is not adding to his word. Now, this passage is is a key passage in the whole charismatic gospel and the charismatic gospel has has gone into almost every denomination to some degree some more, more greatly than others and it is the key uh, it is a gospel that is very very uh, flamboyant it is very uh, uh, the people involved feel like they really have the evidence of the holy spirit acting in their life but the whole business is a wrong gospel. It has nothing to do with the gospel of salvation because they have come to that by violating uh, the principle that we are to compare Scripture with Scripture and find the spiritual meaning of what God has indicated wherever God has spoken. But thank you, Brazil, for that very, very big question. And now we're going to go to our first caller on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening. Yes. What I, what I can think? Yes. In honor talking to you, sir. I listen to Family Radio uh, to Open Forum uh, via the Internet, and it's really a blessing uh, to be able to even record it uh, uh, Open Forum. Too. Okay, what I can think. It's, my call is about uh, the callers that are saying why you are the only one, the only preacher, pre hello? Yes, go yeah, ahead. That you are the only preacher talking about that the church is, is over. Well, what I would like to tell those callers is that uh, the big shot preachers, you know, they make their financial living, you know, and most, and most of them are really luxurious type of living, selling, you know, their wear basically to to people going in the churches. So they are not going to be telling anybody that the church is is over, people. The show is over. Go home and study your Bibles on your own. And, and the other, uh, you can say the other pastors, they are not going to, 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 do, to say the church is, is over because most of them, that's how they make their living from their churches, their well, financial well-being yeah, from of course, their churches. Excuse me, it is true that that certainly is a real, real problem out there. But also, there are very humble pastors who earnestly think they are doing God's will as they are faithful to their Baptist church or the Baptist denomination or their Presbyterian denomination. They're very humble men. Uh, and uh, and believe they are very faithful. Their problem is that it's not a matter that they uh, are first concerned about uh, losing their living. That that may enter into it to some degree if if the church age ends. But their problem is 
that they have put their trust in their denomination, in the creeds of the church or the denomination that they belong to. And they haven't, God has not opened their spiritual eyes that, to the fact that their denomination has not, not followed the whole Bible. It is, has only taken certain verses out of the Bible and developed their creeds from these and has not, uh, has not, uh, uh, set up, uh, uh, or, or c come to re the realization that our trust can never be in a series of creeds or in what a denomination teaches. Our trust can only be in the Bible, and therefore we ought to be ready to critique uh, and correct anything that our church teaches. And now that's a different matter. Uh, that is, if, if uh, we are to correct it, if it, isn't, if it doesn't square with the Bible, and uh, they're not ready to do that either because... Uh, that would uh, put them in trouble with their whole denomination. So uh, we, we, we can't really uh, decide what the real motive of it all is, but we do know this, that before anybody will come to truth, God has to open their spiritual ears and eyes. And if any of us have come to truth, so that we recognize these things from the Bible. We can't take any credit for it. We can't say we were wiser or that we were more humble or we were this or that. It's only the mercy of God. And why me and not someone else? But that's the way, uh, that's the way we have to look at it. Oh, Lord, thank you. And, and, uh, and all I want to do is pray for these others that some of them, too, might have their spiritual eyes open. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Kenfi. May God bless you and uh, the whole family radio uh, family. Thank you for Thank calling you. and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, hello. 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 Yes. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi. Uh, Mr. Camping? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the other night, um, I heard um, the topic being discussed about um, uh, uh, when would be the um, end of the world, and um, uh, the date of 2011 came up, and um, I've often heard people call in and say that... Um, how could you pick such a date like that when in Matthew 24 it says um, no man could know the day or the hour? Now, I'd like to put this uh, thought forward, which I've uh, wondered about. And um, I've heard a lot of um, different uh, explanations as to... Um, it's true that no man can know the day or the hour, but we can know the month and or the year. It doesn't, no, I mean, uh, where you say, well, it, the Bible doesn't say we can't know the month and we, we can't know the year. So, uh, so then you came to this conclusion by your research of the scriptures that it can be 2011. But now here's my um, idea. Uh, I'd liken... What Jesus says about no man can know the day or the hour to a birth. And how I come to that conclusion is um, in the beginning of the chapter of Matthew 24, the disciples wanted to know what would be the sign of his coming and of the end of the world. Now, um, so... The way I understand it is that the new heavens and the new earth will be, to me, in my idea, is a new, a new beginning for the earth, as the Bible declares. So that, to me, is like a, a, the earth being born again. Now, and then I thought, well, no man can know the day or the hour. So if, in fact, that is true, then that is liking it to a birth. 
And then in First Thessalonians chapter 5, um, no, I think, is it chapter 5? Yes, it's 5. Yeah. You're on the right. Yes. Yeah, he, um, and one of the passages says that, um, excuse me, I'm a little nervous. It'll be like a woman in travail. Yeah, a woman yeah. in travail. Yeah, now let me pick up what you're saying now. The fact is that there are two kinds of people in the world. Uh, and the Bible very clearly describes it. There are those who are watching. And how do we watch? We search the Bible. And we trust the Bible. And we learn from the Bible. And we read in Matthew 24, uh, that uh, in verse 43, Know this, that if the good man, that is the householder of the house, had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. In other words, God is saying if we're watching... Uh, the thief is not going to surprise us. But if we're not watching, of course, then the thief will surprise us. And that is what First Thessalonians 5 is teaching. We read, and, and, you're, and when it talks there about a, uh, this is equivalent to a birth, yes, that is for the unsaved. Look, we're reading in, uh, in verse 2 of First Thessalonians 5. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And for the whole world that is not watching, that is not really trusting the whole Bible, and therefore they have no uh, any substantial idea of any kind as the signs of the time or how bad things are in the church world or the... Uh, an understanding of the great tribulation or any of that. They don't have that because they're not trusting the Bible at all. They're not watching. And so when Christ comes, for them, whether they're in the church or out and have no relationship to the Bible at all, it, Christ will come as a thief in the night. And he says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety... Then sudden destruction cometh upon them. You know, he's still talking about those for whom Christ comes as the thief in the night. Now we're going to pause for this message and then I'll finish looking at these verses. I'm talking to a caller about what the Bible will allow us to know concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus. We learn from Matthew 24 that if we are watching we will not be overtaken like a thief in the night. We will know something about what hour the thief is coming. But on the other hand, let's, uh, when we read 1 Thessalonians 5, we, saw, we see that uh, for the peoples of the world, Christ will come as a thief in the night, for when they shall say, this is verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians 5, when they shall say, Peace and safety. That is, everything is going along very well, thank you. And we have our plans. We're, build, going, we're saving for a big vacation. We are planning uh, to build a new house or to take a trip. Uh, we, uh, uh, and so on and so on. And that's characteristic of every human. We all have our plans. And, uh, and uh, we... Uh, we know someday Christ is going to come. In fact, w let's go on in, for verse 3. P uh, for when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now remember, it's talking about those who are for, for whom Christ is coming as a thief in the night. Every human being intuitively uh, because he is create, created in the image of God and the law of God is on his heart, is in his, uh, in his heart to some degree, knows that eventually there is a judgment day. They know that even though they can submerge that into their conscious mind so that they never want to think about it, but it is there. And uh, therefore, uh, when we mention the word doomsday or something like that, uh, every human 
uh, has some idea that we're talking about the fact that this world will end. But when? It's way off in the wild blue yonder. We know it's going to happen, but we don't, we can't know anything really about it. And so God uses the figure of a child that, uh, the, of a woman that is uh, going to give birth to a child. Uh, that woman knows that there is going to be a birth that is going to happen. And, and she can even know approximately when it might happen. But on the other hand, she, if, unless, uh, unless uh, uh, there is an interference from the outside, as we can now with uh, C-sections and so on, but uh, ordinarily, uh, that baby will be born at a time that that woman does not know. It could be uh, suddenly she could go into labor tomorrow if she's getting close to the end, or she might, it might be two, three weeks down the way. But that baby will be born. And that is the figure that God uses. We, the world consents, the churches, even in the local congregations. There, there's lots of talk about uh, we must be getting near the end. Ever since, oh, the last ten years or so, there's been many people who have prophesied or declared we're, uh, we're, uh, uh, Christ is going to return one of these days. We're right near the end, and and uh, uh, there is that kind of a thinking. But but no, it's nothing we have to get really troubled by, because we can't know anymore. Christ is going to come as a thief in the night, and so this is what God declares: they shall not escape. It's going to come because that when Christ comes, it's judgment day. But now notice verse four. We have a complete change of, of, of thinking here. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Well, now, if the day isn't going to take, overtake us as a thief, we're like the householder who, who uh, knows who's been watching, who's been watching. He knows something about the timing of the, of the return. And that's why we read in verse 5 of 1 Thessalonians 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day, and are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch. You see that again? Let us watch that and be sober. That is, be serious about this. And, and that's all we're doing as we search the Bible. That's where we have to watch. This is where we have to get our information from. There's no other way we can get information. We have to get it from the Bible. And as we study the Bible, we read about the Great Tribulation. We read about all kinds of things that relate to that. And, and we tie this scripture with that scripture and, and get harmony uh, as we go all through the Bible. And pretty soon we begin to see the time patterns and we can say with some certainty that there's a high probability that we have begun to understand the timing of the end. And, and uh, that's where we are. But thank you. For... Yeah, could I just say one more thing if it's be yes. all right with you? Yeah, and uh, I just want to add just a little tidbit here that every woman that is pregnant she can know for some certainty what year and what month she's about to deliver, but of the day and the hour, her, uh, herself as well as no doctor or anybody can know the day or the hour. If it's a natural birth, that yeah. is absolutely correct, and that's a good insight. And thank you so much for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Yes. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead with your call, please. I am a first. I am a first time caller on your program. Yes. I'm. I'm calling about the birth of Christ. Yes. What does it say in the Bible where Christ, when Christ was born? 
Well, it doesn't say it. Uh, it we God gives. Uh, could you please turn your radio off? We're getting some feedback. Uh, the Bible does not give us uh, uh, information that says Christ was born on this day or this hour. But it's curious. God gives us a lot of information that we wonder why does He say this? For example, He tells us that that. Uh, uh, excuse me, the priest Zacharias uh, was of the uh, course of Abijah, and we learn from the Bible that was the eighth course of the priesthood. Uh, uh, and Zechariah was uh, engaged in priestly activity at the time he was told that he would, uh, he and his aged wife uh, Elizabeth, would give birth to John the Baptist. Why does the Bible say that when John the Baptist was, or when uh, Elizabeth was in her sixth month, that at that time uh, uh, Mary was visited by the angel and, uh, and was told that she would become with child by the Holy Spirit? Why does it give uh, some other information of this nature? Why does it tell us that... Uh, that when the Magi came, the, uh, the, the men from the east, uh, to uh, bring gifts and show honor to the baby Jesus, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, they told uh, uh, the wicked Herod that they had seen the star two years earlier. Uh, and uh, and so on and so on. All little pieces of information that just kind of tantalize us and stand out there. But when we harness all these together and and tie them together, we find that we cannot say absolutely, but we can say there's an exceedingly high probability that Christ was born on or very near October 1 in the year 7 B.C. And, uh, and that fits uh, all this, the spiritual nature of Christ because 7 B.C. was a jubilee year and Christ is the very essence of the jubilee. The, the essence of the jubilee was to proclaim liberty to the nations or to the lands throughout the land. And the Day of Atonement in the year 8 B.C., or uh, 7 B.C., rather, which was the probable, uh, uh, very close to the day when Christ was born, and maybe the day was also in t tied in with the Jubilee. And so we have a lot of circumstantial evidence, and, and more also as we go through the time patterns of the Bible, uh, circumstantial evidence that points uh, that to the very high likelihood that Jesus was born uh, possibly on October 1 in 7 B.C. And, and, and uh, utilizing only biblical information. This is, this is uh, uh, God ha gave us that information for some reason, and certainly uh, 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 we, uh, we can... Uh, we're not about to say now we're not going to sell Chris, celebrate Christmas on December 25th anymore. We're going to celebrate it on October 1. Fact is, the Bible doesn't tell us that we have to celebrate Christmas or that the birth of Christ was a holy day of some kind. The Bible doesn't say that. So we'll leave it at December 25th. But in our understanding of the Bible, we can say, but there's more, a far greater likelihood he was born on October 1. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camden. Yes. I'd like to ask you a question about um, drinking wine. Yes. And also, uh, can you read a verse for me in the Scripture? Uh, Jeremiah 35, 2 to 6. Yeah, you're talking about the Rechabites, I believe, who were, uh, who uh, Jeremiah was told by God to bring them into the temple and set before them uh, cups of wine. And, uh, and now they are hearing now from the true prophet of God, Jeremiah. And uh, they refused to drink that wine, and this is recorded in Jeremiah 25. 
because they are completely obedient to their father and their father had taught them you are never to drink wine and so they're saying we cannot obey this command uh, to drink this wine and then God uh, uh, truly uh, blessed them and said you know here are the Rechabites they're being faithful to their fathers and 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 uh, the, the rule that had been laid down and uh, they're not about to uh, avoid it and uh, and uh, therefore he said of the Rechabites uh, in verse uh, uh, in the uh, verse 18 thus saith the Lord of hosts the God of Israel because ye have obeyed the commandments of Jonadab your father and kept all his precepts and done according unto all that he hath commanded you therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts the God of Israel Jonadab the son of Rechab shall not want or ever be without a man to stand before me forever and on the other hand he told it, uh, Judah of that day there in verse 17 therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts the God of Israel behold I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them because I have spoken unto them but they have not heard and I have called unto them but they have not answered in other words God used the Rechabites as a picture of those who are faithful to our Heavenly Father and uh, and uh, will not fall into sin uh, uh, and, and go another way than what uh, what uh, our Heavenly Father wants and yet the Jews uh, were going their own way and they came under the judgment of God mm -hmm. so uh, do you think it's a sin to drink wine? Well, we can't, you, we can't tell from this particular passage. Uh, we have to look elsewhere. And uh, we do find that, uh, that uh, wine is, uh, when we compare Scripture with Scripture, go all through the Bible, we find, for example, in, uh, in uh, Proverbs chapter 31, it is not for drink, kings to drink wine or desire strong drink. And spiritually, every true believer is a king. We are seated with Christ in the heavenlies, even though we've been dispatched to this earth to serve as ambassadors of Christ until our work is done and we return to heaven. But, uh, but uh, here God says we're not to drink wine or desire strong drink. Uh, we do read in the New Testament uh, where the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, admonished uh, his young protege Timothy take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your many ailments indicating to us as near as I can tell from that that we can uh, uh, use wine for medicinal purposes but uh, the fact is that when we t look at everything in the Bible and the Bible says for example don't look upon wine when it is red and wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging we read in uh, uh, or around Proverbs uh, 20 or thereabouts, uh, and and when we take everything in the Bible, we find that no wine is not for the true believer. We have something way better. Now now notice, if the world has a birthday party or a celebration of some kind, what is the centerpiece of that celebration? It will be the alcoholic table where there is champagne or there is spiked punch or there are wine bottles or, uh, of one kind or another because wine is, is given by God to unsaved man in order to take a little bit of the edge off of the rigors of this life. They, uh, they are uh, on their own. God is not, uh, is not uh, gu guiding them. And, and uh, by taking that glass of wine, like even a, a glass of wine for dinner, takes the edge off and it makes the, the food more palatable and so on. Uh, of course, there's a big danger because if one glass 
makes me feel a little better. Two glasses ought to make me feel even better. And then by the time I get to the third or fourth glass, I'm be beginning to begin a little bit uh, to be inebriated or drunk, and uh, I can easily end up under the table, so to speak. But uh, but uh, with all the horrors that go with drunkenness. But on the other hand, when the body of believers or when a, a group of believers or just a few believers come together and they want to rejoice, uh, do they have to go for a, b a bottle of wine? Absolutely not. The Bible says, in, uh, or when they are faced with the rigors of this life, do we have to have a glass of wine in order to take the rough edge off? The Bible says no, no. We read in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to the Lord, and the peace of God that passeth understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, we can go directly to God. We can come boldly to the throne of grace and get all the help that we need. We absolutely do not need a crutch like wine or anything of that nature in order to uh, relieve the tensions from us. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Uh, yes, hi. I have two questions for you this evening, sir. Um, one of them has to do with a particular verse in Scripture. Um, uh, but I'll start with my other question, which is a hypothetical situation, but I wanted you to um, give me a little insight as to what the Bible has to say about this. Um, the first situation is, if there is uh, an unsaved man and woman, and they marry, and then that marriage ends in divorce, and um, years later that woman remarries, but uh, during her second marriage she becomes saved, what is she responsible to do concerning what the Bible has to say about divorce and remarriage? Well, the fact is that the Bible indicates in the Old Testament, uh, first of all, the Bible does say that what God has joined together. It's one person with one with another person. It's not three people joining together. It's one. It's two people joining together. And the, and the Bible indicates that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, the the wife is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But the Bible also uh, indicates that there were those who had a second were. Uh, a second wife or a third wife or even a fourth wife and nowhere do we ever read that because they had a second or third wife that they were to divorce the second or third wife or uh, in order to end up with one wife uh, God allowed uh, even though it was wrong it was altogether uh, violating other laws of the Bible and yet they were to live in that because there was not to be divorced for any reason even though it was a second or a third marriage there was not to be divorced and so here is a person who has divorced they have remarried and that's a wrong kind of a marriage now they became saved uh, they are to continue in that second marriage as if it were a first marriage. They cannot divorce. They are, uh, but they are never again to think about divorce. And okay. Uh, my second question has to do uh, with a passage in the book of Mark. Yes. Um, chapter 13. Yes. It's verses uh, 14, uh, specifically verse 17 there. I know there was a previous caller calling... Uh, having something to do with pregnant women in the in the last days, so I, I've tuned in part way through, so I'm not familiar with what they said. Well, that's that. Uh, uh, when God talked about uh, uh, in First Thessalonians five about a woman with child, God is not speaking about individuals who have who are pregnant. He is talking about the fact that Christ's coming is typified by the situation of a woman that is with child. She knows that child is going to be born, but she doesn't know the specific time uh, or when that child will be born. But that child is going to be born. Now that's, that's simply looking at a theological 
uh, uh, doctrine here that Christ is coming and unless we are watching by searching the Bible carefully we're not going to know uh, when that uh, Christ is coming like the woman does not know the day or the hour when the when the baby is going to be born but here in Mark 13 verse 17 God is talking about something else he is talking about the period of great tribulation and the period of great tribulation uh, for the whole world continued for a, a very short period of time. From everything we read in the Bible, it looked like it was the 2300 evening mornings of Daniel 8, which would be a little over six years. But for the local congregations that are sprinkled all through the world, uh, parts of uh, uh, any local congregation, that great tribulation continues right till the end. And the nature of the great tribulation is that there is no one, no possibility of salvation. Now, uh, uh, throughout the whole great tribulation, that is from the time it began all the way until Christ returns again, anyone belonging to a congregation, uh, it's in a place where God is absent from insofar as bringing anyone to salvation. The Holy Spirit is not operating there at all. And so pity those who are with child. Those families that are sitting there in the pew each Sunday and trusting that that particular church is still faithfully declaring the word of God and those ch parents are faithfully praying to God, oh God have mercy upon our children that they too might become a child of God and what they have failed to realize is that they have placed their children and themselves in a place where there is no possibility of salvation. They're locked in to a path that is heading for hell. And that is why it says, Woe unto them that are with child in those days. Uh, it is, uh, if we read the book of Lamentations, which that little book that comes right after Jeremiah, it's a lament that God wrote uh, uh, through the scribe Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, uh, lamenting the terrible, terrible situation that prevails uh, because uh, Judah came under the attack and Jerusalem came uh, under the attack first of Egypt and and uh, then of uh, and then of Babylon that eventually destroyed it. And uh, in that lament, we read here in uh, in uh, verse uh, eleven of, Jer of Lamentations chapter two. Uh, mine eyes do fail with tears my bowels are troubled my liver is poured upon the earth for the destruction of the daughter of my people because the children and the sucklings swoon in the streets of the city they say to their mothers where is corn and wine when they swooned as the wounded in the streets of the city when their soul was poured out into their mother's bosom now there was physical killing at that time but that's this language is spiritually saying you know uh, there's no there's no gospel of salvation anymore because uh, the gospel has to have the application of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of those who are to become saved and that's what it's talking about here when it says where is the corn and wine it's gone it's gone there is no gospel of salvation no matter how faithful that pastor uh, believes he is preaching uh, to the Word of God it, uh, it, it will not be applied to anyone's life because the Holy Spirit has left that congregation. And that uh, is the uh, direction God is taking us when it talks about uh, this in, in uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 17. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Tappan. Yes. It's a pleasure speaking to you this evening. I have a couple of questions. First of all, can you define Selah for me? 
Yes, Selah, if we, uh, the best we can find is that it, it's a synonym for valuable. In other words, it's like God has made a statement and then it's a pause to emphasize this is of great value. Uh, that is really the best meaning we can find for the word Selah. Secondly, can you please ex explain to me, I'll take this off the air, explain to me your interpretation of Revelation. When um, uh, Jesus died on the cross, that Satan was silenced for the church age, and then he was not silent for the days of tribulation. Now, I know I lived for a long time in the church age, and Satan was definitely alive. You know, so maybe I misunderstand you. No, I, I understand your question. Hold Thank on. You. Now, right after this message, we'll look at that. We have a caller on the line who has asked about three or four very mysterious verses that we read in the opening, the opening verses of Revelation chapter 20. Uh, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and, uh, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And then we read in verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his uh, prison. Now, uh, this is uh, earthly language in which God is, is picturing a pit, a deep, pit uh, and uh, and uh, there uh, 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 he has thrown Satan into and uh, bound him there and shut him up and sealed that pit so that Satan cannot deceive the nations for a period of a thousand years and uh, that is the earthly language and my my that's it's how are we going to understand this? Because we know we have to compare spiritual things with spiritual. We've got to figure out how all of this fits into the gospel. And so we have to uh, very carefully go through the Bible trying to find other information that might relate in order to figure out what the spiritual meaning of all this is. The first thing that we discover is that uh, as we search the Bible, the time when there was a great change in the fortunes of Satan was at the time of the cross. Uh, we uh, we uh, read there that he was, uh, other language in the Bible, that he was cast out of heaven at that time. He was given a death blow at that time. And so we are on pretty solid ground when we uh, understand that, that uh, this uh, event of throwing uh, Satan into the pit and, and sealing him up there and, and binding him in there must identify with the time of the cross. But then we got problems because uh, the Bible says uh, throughout the New Testament era uh, he goes about as a roaring lion and we've learned that he has been busy sowing the churches with tares already when we read uh, Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 as it's talking about the seven churches that were in existence early on in the church already it talks about Satan's seat is there uh, and, and uh, uh, other language of that nature and so now we begin to puzzle well what does it mean that he was uh, uh, cast into a pit and that uh, he could not deceive the nations anymore. We get a little help from uh, the parable of the sower that went forth to sow, where we read that, that the seed that fell by the wayside, that it's typifying the word of God that came on the hearts of certain people, and the birds uh, plucked it away before it could f take, get, uh, find any root at all in the soil. And uh, God emphasized that's like Satan takes the word of God so it cannot go into the hearts of anybody. 
And uh, so uh, we know that uh, we have to put that put that into the into the equation of how are we going to understand this. Well, when we sum it all up, we find that the thousand years are actually a synonym for complete completeness, and that thousand years uh, is the period from the time of the cross until uh, till the uh, uh, time when Satan is loosed at the beginning of the period of great tribulation. That is, uh, that is, uh, uh, in which we are presently that that time. And and when it talks about this, that he could not deceive the nations, it doesn't mean that he was taken out of existence. He's still the prince of the power of the air all through the church age. But it does mean he could not frustrate God's plan to save those that he God planned to save. Remember that before the time of the cross, very, very few people were saved. Uh, even though Christ, as the perfect preacher, was preaching perfect sermons and healing thousands of people and, and feeding thousands of people miraculously and raising the dead and so on, and yet virtually nobody became saved because Satan had not yet been bound and and at the same time the Holy Spirit was not active in applying that word. But then Pentecost came along a few days after Christ went back to heaven and about 3,000 were saved. And so two things that happened. First of all, Satan had been taken out of the way so that he could not frustrate God's plan to save these about 3,000 and the Holy Spirit was present now had come into the local congregation beginning there and, and uh, this would go on throughout the, uh, the church age applying the word of God to those who would that God planned to save and so that is really the way we are to understand this that throughout the church age uh, Christ ruled in the church. He was the supreme ruler, any church that was still reasonably true to the word of God. And there would be people becoming saved wherever the Bible was. And uh, Satan could not stop that, even though he could intimidate and he could try, try to fill that church with terrors, with people who appeared to be saved and yet were still under his authority and and uh, and uh, so on and that's why we read in Ephesians 6 for example that we are to put on the whole armor of God because we wrestle not with flesh and blood but with principalities and powers we have to recognize that Satan is out there uh, throughout the church age uh, going about as an angel of light and as ministers of righteousness but he is bound in the sense that he cannot frustrate in any way God's plan to save those that he, as, as the gospel uh, is faithfully, uh, reasonably faithfully declared in the, in the local congregations. But now that he's been loosed, it means that now he has been allowed to become the king, uh, the ruler in the local congregations. He is, uh, he is loosed for a little season. The Holy Spirit has abandoned the local congregation. Christ is no longer reigning there. It is Satan who has uh, been given, has uh, taken over, and uh, and this is what is signifying when he has been loosed. Now, this is just trying to summarize a whole lot of scriptures that apply in order to arrive at this kind of a summary. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yeah. I have a quick question about Satan and what Revelation and uh, Ezekiel both say about him being cast to the earth. Uh, it, I know time becomes a little strange when it comes to God because he doesn't live in the constraints of time or he, he's not a being of of time but i i still don't know if satan has been cast out of heaven yet could, uh, i guess mainly because of job uh, and satan reporting back to god basically for 
for that purpose. So it doesn't seem like he's out of heaven yet. I, well, could, excuse could you me. Elaborate on that, please. Well, yes. You see, the, uh, the book of Job, chapter one, clearly indicates that at that time, as God is writing the the language that we find in the book of Job, Satan did have, ac uh, did have access into heaven. Then remember when Jesus was preaching, or, or was sending out the 70, and the 70 were all rejoicing that the devils were subject unto them, and then Christ said, uh, Behold, I see Satan falling as lightning from heaven. And then we get to Revelation 12, and there God assures us, yes, he's been cast out. He was defeated by the blood of Christ. That is when Christ went to the cross. We read in Revelation 12, in verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out unto the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren, see how that ties back to John to Job chapter 1, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And, uh, and by the word of their uh, testimony, and they loved not their eyes, their uh, lives unto death. And so uh, we have no, no uh, misunderstanding at all. Uh, because of the cross, uh, Satan was cast out of heaven, and there was an enormous change in his, uh, in, in his activities, although he still could go about as a roaring lion and he could still uh, be busy trying to bring his kind of people into the local congregations and so on. Okay, well, I, the main reason I asked that was because I know that since the creation of the earth that Satan was able to tempt uh, on the earth. And when it got to Job, it's, it, it seemed like he got cast down and then when you get to Revelations or Ezekiel talking about the about him being cast down, I wasn't sure if that was a a prophecy looking back on the vision saying that he will be. No, no. Uh, even though I used the words that he was. So no. I was I was a little confused on that, but thanks for clearing that up. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. How you doing, Brother Cappy? Very well, thank you. All right. I know a gentleman called about um, about the, um, the wine situation. Um, I'm going to read this, and then I'll let you answer that out there. Um, I think that's in Romans 14. Um, yeah, where it speaks about laws concerning meat and drink. Right, that's it. Yes, and uh, and you see... Romans 14 is a longer statement that is summarized in Colossians chapter 2. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 2, which is really a summary statement or a recapitulation of, of, the, of a much longer statement in the book of Romans. Now, here, the setting is this, that for 1,500 years almost, God had focused his full attention on the nation of Israel. Uh, they were the congregation of Israel. They were the external representation of the kingdom of God. Uh, they uh, they uh, had the temple in Jerusalem, the holy city. The temple was had the holy of holies within it. Uh, it was uh, it. Uh, they were everything spiritually. You, and and uh, and now God has come to a time uh, when He was going to shift from the nation of Israel to the Church Age, which would consist of of the Gentiles all over the world, as well as a remnant of the Jews that would become true believers. And and uh, that was going to be a major shift, of course, to be suddenly cast uh, out of that role of the 
of, uh, of that favored position that the nation of Israel had been uh, and to shift to the church age, that was of a monumental consequence. Now, during the, uh, the uh, time when Israel was the congregation, God had give, given many, many ceremonial laws. Laws concerning the offering of burnt sacrifices, of blood sacrifices, laws concerning meat and drink and special days and, and so on and so on. And they were all a very integral part of the worship activities of the nation of Israel, which were the congregation of the, uh, the external representation of the kingdom of God. Okay, now we have come to the time of the church age when God has, has, is no longer at all active in the synagogue. Uh, the temple lasted a few more years and then in A.D. 70 it was destroyed. And, uh, and uh, in the New Testament church age, all, none of those Old Testament ceremonial laws uh, were to be observed anymore. They were all completed in Christ. In the New Testament, all God left uh, uh, to be observed was, uh, as a ceremonial law, was water baptism and, and uh, the Lord's table. They were the only two ceremonies that were still to be uh, utilized. And so it was just a major change. And bear in mind, uh, the twelve apostles were Jews, and the uh, most of the first believers were Jews, and and to shift from from a whole long heritage of temple worship and and ceremonial laws concerning meat and drink, and and uh, now to uh, to go into these uh, 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 heathen or these uh, these uh, uh, churches were the heathen, were the Gentiles who who were not Jews at all, were worshiping. It was just a big, big change. And so God devotes the whole uh, chapter of Romans 14 to that, and he sums it up in Colossians chapter 2. He says in verse uh, 16, uh, Colossians 2 verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, these were all identified with various ceremonial laws, or of the Sabbath, there was the seventh day Sabbath, the seventh year Sabbath, uh, all that had to be rigorously uh, observed throughout the time when God was uh, using the nation of Israel as the congregation. And now he's explaining, don't let anyone judge you about that now. They are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And in, uh, and in other words, uh, for a little while there, there was great uh, Difficulty for these pious Jews who uh, who did become true believers to leave the uh, the ceremonial uh, laws of meat and drink and so on. Just as today, it's very very similar, incidentally, to what we're having today uh, throughout the church age. The Lord's Supper and the water baptism have become uh, been elevated to a very high position in connection with the worship of Christ, uh, far beyond what the Bible ever intended, far beyond what the Bible ever intended, but nevertheless, there it is. And one of the greatest difficulty a great people, many people have of obeying the command to come out of the churches, as we are commanded today, is then I have to leave, I can't, my children can't be baptized in water anymore. Who's going to do it? And uh, I can't partake of the Lord's Supper anymore. Uh, isn't that an absolute necessary part of my worship of Christ? And, and the answer is no, of course not. They, there's no substance in those things. They are signs pointing to some aspect of the gospel, but they are themselves uh, not the gospel. And, and yet it is a difficult time uh, just because those uh, two ceremonial laws had become a part of our regular worship activity and when you multiply this many times as what happened uh, in the when the Jews 
uh, were the external representation of the kingdom of God and they rigorously left kept the seventh day Sabbath and, and the Passover day and the uh, new moons and, uh, and the laws concerning meat and drink you can imagine how difficult it was and so God is simply indicating in Romans 14 and Colossians 2 verse 16 and 17 look those things were a shadow of things to come. Don't they are not substantive, substantive? Don't think of them as being super important in any way. Let anyone do whatever he wishes to do about it. But they have really nothing to do with the substance of the gospel. That is, they don't add one iota to our faith. They don't. Uh, they don't uh, initiate salvation. They really are. are they're only a sign. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, I live in the Galveston, uh, Texas area, and I have a couple concerns. One is I live only 10 miles from Galveston, and you have a radio there station that broadcasts your, your uh, daily uh, activity. But you cannot hear it 10 miles away from Galveston. Can you more or less explain to me why not and what, can, what needs to be done to be able to go further down to inside Houston? I, I'll tell you what the problem is. In, in, uh, in uh, the United States, radio is very carefully regulated by the Federal Com uh, uh, Commission of Communications. Uh, our communications commission and and every existing radio station is protected to make sure that somebody else will not encroach upon their signal that protects us but it also protects others and so if we have a station uh, uh, like we have one in Beaumont Texas it goes so far but no further and we we can't uh, get approval to make it go further because if we if uh, if we would make it go further we would be stepping on the toes of some other radio station and and we're constantly examining uh, every possibility of expanding whatever we can expand once in a great while we'll see an opportunity uh, to uh, put an application into the FCC to cause one of our stations to uh, be able to reach out a little farther once in a while we can even find a place where we can uh, uh, build a new radio station but uh, it's it's very very difficult however in our country we have uh, the wonderful th blessing that we do broadcast by short wave if, if somebody is outside of the listening area, area of a uh, FM or an AM station that broadcasts family radio, if they get a shortwave radio, they can get a quite a good signal at any time uh, of our programming. And secondly, we are on internet, and they can hear us uh, any time, day or night, on internet uh, wherever they may be, anywhere in the world, for that matter. And on these days, you know, of uh, iPod and so on. Uh, you can even uh, 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 put our programming from internet to iPod, and then from iPod you can bring it, uh, you can uh, store it there and and uh, take it with you in your truck or in your car or on vacation or or wherever. And uh, in other words, you can continue to listen, or you can tie it into your uh, into your uh, FM radio that's in your kitchen or some place where your computer isn't and uh, because uh, in other words there are we have quite a lot of opportunity here to hear family radio even though it's not always quite as nice as it is to have an FM or an AM station close by but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum Mr. Good, Camping yes Mr. Camping, uh, I have two questions for you. Yes. Um, first question, Mr. Camping, is when did the beginning of the church age cease to exist? When did that actually begin to happen? Well, when we, 
when we uh, examine the Bible and, and lay out all the time patterns as accurately as possible, it seems like there's a high likelihood that the end of the church age occurred in the year 1988, probably in the, sp in the spring of the year, uh, around sometime in May, uh, there, that is, that's where the, where the time pattern seems to fit uh, quite accurately. And my second question, Mr. Camping, is why do you think, uh, does the Bible answer the following question, or do you know the answer to this question? That question is, why do you think that God even bothers with dealing with Satan, uh, in the way that the Bible describes that he does, such as the thousand years that he would be locked up. Why wouldn't God just eliminate Satan? Uh, why even let him have any kind of power over the church or anyone else for that matter? Well, that's a very good question. You know, I've asked this question uh, myself. But why at the time that Satan caused Eve to uh, rebel against God and eat of the uh, fruit of the forbidden tree. Why didn't God throw Satan into hell right there? After all, he had, uh, he had rebelled against God, and God had every authority, every right to throw him into hell right there, and, uh, and so he could never, never mess with mankind again. Why did he do that? When we search the Bible, we find there is evidence that the reason that God allowed Satan to be the ruler over mankind uh, throughout the history of the world is because uh, God wanted sin to be more sinful. That is, with Satan ruling, uh, the fact is, any tiny little sin causes mankind, has caused mankind to be under the wrath of God. And yet we may not recognize that tiny little sin as being sufficient cause. And, and so God uh, did a couple of things. He, he gave us the law in order to make sin more sinful, because wherever the law is, there is rebellion, and so that we see uh, uh, greater and greater sins. And he also has put Satan in charge uh, so of mankind so that he too could uh, further uh, uh, accelerate and, and, and cause greater sins to appear so that uh, by the time we get to Judgment Day we can recognize that indeed, yes, we, we have been very sinful, that uh, sin indeed has greatly multiplied. Now, I'm, I'm trying to say, uh, bring across a pretty big uh, piece of information just in a few sentences, and that's a little difficult to do. But and and now in the end of the church age, again, God has allowed Satan to come into the churches in order to to make them more sinful. As long as the Holy Spirit was there acting, uh, there was a limit to what Satan could do. He could bring in the tares. He could bring in people who uh, who uh, were not saved and and who were under his authority, but he couldn't take the actual rule. Oh, my, we've run out of time. At another time, we'll talk a little more about this. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.